Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Perkinson, and I'm here this morning because uh, Scott Minard got a head cold and his doctor advised him against uh, flying here. But it's really something more than that. Uh, I represent a, a firm that manages $230 billion worth of uh, pension funds, insurance company, and sovereign wealth fund money. And what we and our clients would like to do is provide financing solutions to sustainable development in the Arctic and in elsewhere. It occurs to me <clears throat> that we find ourselves at a point in this region, but also globally, of rapid change. Um, my colleagues have talked about uh, the nature of climate change in the Arctic, uh, the nature of uh, societal change in the Arctic. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the concept, the traditional concept of development and developmental finance is also changing. And perhaps an era where development was the sole purview of international financial institutions and sovereign governments may be coming to an end. <clears throat> As governments seek to provide opportunity and other forms uh, uh, of things for their uh, societies. At the same time, most Western governments have convinced us that they're bankrupt and unable to provide the financing for traditional forms of infrastructure and development that they once did. Yet at the same time, there's $35 trillion worth of pension fund money in the, in the world, so-called patient capital, that's sitting on the sidelines in a global search for yield. We ourselves believe that infrastructure investment, whether it's traditional hard infrastructure, such as bridges and airports, or social infrastructure, such as schools and hospitals and broadband internet and medical service delivery technology, <clears throat> is in fact a proxy for traditional fixed income investment. Now, at the same time, I'm not so arrogant as to believe that the private sector can do it alone just as I don't believe we're in a position where governments can do it alone or non-government organizations can do it alone. We will require so-called public-private partnerships, or I think uh, uh, a better term is unusual alliances. And Carter made reference to the conversation that he had with my senior colleague, Scott, here a year ago. And from that conversation, uh, we realized that perhaps we have more in common uh, than we have that separates us. For in fact, we envision a period of time in the not too distant future where if a project is not sustainable, it simply doesn't get built. <clears throat> so I think that we're pleased to be working with the World Wildlife Fund and others, but there are others out there that we need to work with. There's a role for governments. Governments, after all, regulate uh, the sectors in which infrastructure, whether it's hard infrastructure or so-called soft infrastructure are built. There's a role for societies, both indigenous communities and local communities, to determine what the social norms are that will govern what gets built where and when. And I think that there's a role, uh, I hope it's okay for me to say, uh, for some of the patient uh, private capital in the world to be put to the test in addressing some of these. Carter made mention of the uh, Arctic Investment Protocol, um, which we were pleased to uh, work with under the aegis of the World Economic Forum along with government officials, uh, scientists, non-government organizations, and others. And it seems to me that the Arctic Investment Protocol, which was released in Switzerland in January of this year, really did nothing more than begin something, set a minimum standard uh, as a code of conduct for private organizations that wish to invest in the Arctic. It seems to me that what this really does is it begins a conversation about aligning the values that governments have societies have and private stakeholders have. Once these values are aligned, then and only then can we assess individual projects and a range of projects for their genuine sustainability in what I believe are four key areas. <clears throat> are those projects environmentally sustainable? Are they economically viable? Do they comport with the social norms in the area? And do they fit within the government regulatory framework? So the fact of the matter is, while we're just a minor player in all of this, we're pleased to work with the World Wildlife Fund, governments, and others, because we think that it makes us more powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you.